Okay, so let me say, of course, welcome to everyone to this workshop on uh, uh, mentoring for foreign students and best practices in that mentoring. My name is Melissa Siegel. I am a professor of migration studies at UNU Merritt and Maastricht University. Yes, and mention. this is a webinar that is being hosted um, uh, by the ILO project. And the ILO project is the International Learning Online Project. And there are a number of aims in this project, but more generally, it aims to promote intercultural understanding, teaching, and learning, and to create new models to integrate well-educated migrants um, into teaching activities and universities. And this is an Erasmus Plus funded project. And we of course have a number of different um, partners within this project and many of them are with us today. So the idea of this webinar is to really um, share best practices amongst those of us who are regularly working and mentoring um, students from a migration background or foreign students. So um, I will in just a moment tell you about the, the people on our panel. Very excited to have a, a, an interesting and strong mix of perceptions and backgrounds and people that have been working with migrants in different ways. Um, and what we'll do then is cover three different questions within this panel and we'll go question by question. Um, so the first question that we will deal with it are, what are the key issues you deal with when mentoring? So looking at um, key issues that students want guidance on and what are the different roles that the mentor can have. The second question we will deal with is the relationship between the teacher or the professor and the students and cultural differences that come into play there. And the third question we will deal with are, what are the key challenges that we face in mentoring and you know what are some good practices to deal with these challenges. Now, let me introduce our panel of speakers to you today. Um, so we have a number of uh, key people. Um, so I'll just introduce them in no particular order, but first we have um, Dr. Tina um, Wickstrom, who is a senior, um, RDI lecturer at Lauria University in Finland, and she has worked for over 20 years with international and migrant students, especially with social services programs and as the Erasmus co-coordinator. She also has a large amount of experience um, with different migration-related EU projects, and her key research interests include inclusion, equity, multidisciplinarity, student wellness, and interculturality. So I think you're very um, excited to have you with us today, Tina, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Happy next, to be here. <laughs> um, next, we have Ahmed Sayer, who is the co-founder and president of the European Migrant Platform, in which is a Brussels-based non-governmental organization. And over the last years, he has worked as a project um, researcher and coordinator and community builder oh. in numerous EU projects. Um, he also holds a master's degree in international political economy with EU external relations at from um, the Brussels School of International Studies. Um, and he's also interested um, in uh, intercultural communities. And he also has a passion for unlocking the potentials of immigrants, um, both for adding value to, to society and integration in their host countries. So Ahmed, we are very happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And oops, sorry, I'm managing just with one screen at the moment, so I'm sorry about that. And we also have with us Sophia Magapolu. So I, I hope I did not butcher that that last name. Um, who has a number of different affiliations. So Sophia um, is a proposal writer at Vid Labs and an assistant researcher at the Laboratory of Applied Political Research at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and has worked as a youth researcher for the European Youth Card Association and the representation of the European Commission in Greece. And she's also held a number of other positions. 
Now, I think this also gives us a lot of room for discussion and people having a lot of different backgrounds and different ways uh, of working with um, international students. I also know that a number of people, I think, in um, in the session right now are also working with international students in different ways. So that's great to see you. And we would very much like to also get your feedback on these different points. Now, not to take up too much time, let me jump right in to our first question. So our first question was, what are key issues you deal with when mentoring? So what are key issues students would like guidance on? And what are different roles that mentors can have? So let me just start this off by turning the floor over to Tina to give us your first thoughts and reflections on this. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I really want to say that uh, these past 20 years, the, the happiest moments I've experienced as a teacher and as a researcher has always been when I work with multicultural or intercultural groups. As they really, especially now that I teach online, uh, it feels like it's a global village when I'm with people from different you know, parts of the world, from different disciplines. It gives so much more viewpoints. And I see it also from the so-called regular Finnish students that they really love it. it. It's really wonderful. Of course, um, it requires quite a lot of um, facilitation also, especially if you are an online teacher. You have to really, uh, when you are uh, mentoring the, the students or student groups, you have to all the time pay attention to the fact that they are very, very, they come from different backgrounds. They have, in addition to being from different cultures, there's different um, age groups and and there's a lot of things. So you have to be a multitasker in a way, in terms of a mentor, you have to pay attention to all the different levels of things that are happening at the same time. Sometimes I have had students, as I'm also been Erasmus coordinator for a really long time, and I've had a lot of exchange students also. Uh, and some of them, if they come, let's say from some Asian countries, they may be first time ever yeah. abroad. So they really need uh, very much mentoring in, in practicalities even. They have ne maybe never left the parents' house there for first time ever uh, staying in, in a new country, in a new situation. So so you have to be also like um, helping them with the, with the practicalities. And then are, are, of course, those little older students who are very well versed already, who have traveled a lot, who know a lot about things. And maybe for them, it's more important that they uh, get to know about certain subjects or content or uh, how to progress in their working life, career path. So I think you, it's very good <laughs> as a teacher or uh, facilitator, you are really a, a multitasker. That is my my personal experience, that you have to have a lot of different roles and, and to, to, uh, to facilitate uh, intercultural groups demands quite a lot of things. And, and you learn all the time. I often say to students also that I really see all of this as a process. I am never ready. It doesn't matter if I've done it 20 years. I feel all the time that I am the learner here and I'm learning from everybody, every person I'm in contact with. So I'm learning from everybody. And uh, But it also gives this wonderful possibility of uh, uh, getting different narratives, getting different stories from people. And I think that keeps me going after 20 years. I, I could really be bored already at my work and I've been 20 years doing something. But I think this is the wonderful opportunity to get to know people younger and little older people from different cultures. So. I would see, say uh, that, that you really need to have a lot of different roles, different hats you have to put on as a mentor in order to be able to really facilitate and, and support students. And also having uh, humbleness, I would say, that I don't have all the answers. I, I, I can help and I can walk with the student, but I don't know everything. And, and they oftentimes also teach me, which I'm very grateful for. So maybe this for starters. Great, thank you for kicking us off, Tina. So then let me move over to Ahmed directly for some of your takeaways here. Thank you. And uh, I would like to start my journey with how I start, uh, how we started European Migrants Platform and how we, you know, reached the idea to set up this NGO. Firstly, maybe that gives us a little bit background about uh, how we deal migrant as well. Uh, my journey starts with and for migrants uh, in 2018. While I was looking for a job, I have attended a project which is uh, titled Fresh Start, aiming to help in uh, migrants with international background to set up their own business. So I attend the kickoff meeting, and then after the kickoff meeting, I find myself as a project coordinator in the meeting. So it was a nice that, which is uh, give me passion to work 
and as well as to also help migrants, which has a similar situation with me. So uh, within the projects, I met several people, not only students, but also the adults, forced migrant, economic migrant, different migrant, back, different mi type of migrant. So within the projects, we help more than 100 uh, people to set up their own business in three different countries. So during these projects, uh, yeah, we have a lot of experience and also lots of uh, interaction with migrants and uh, we understand what are the challenges, what are the issues for migrants when they came a new, when in a new country and which is a totally different from their country of origin. And these issues are can be cultural issues and cultural adjustment, and they also need to know better about the society, about uh, cultural differences, and also try to understand how they can integrate in the new society. And another issue is the language, and language is a key element, I think, key element for all of not only students but also all migrants when they move a new country and it's a new language and they try to learn language and language is a barrier, always barrier for them to integrate. And it takes time to, uh, you know, to feel confident to speak uh, in the host country language. So I think, yeah, first maybe uh, cultural and uh, uh, language is most difficult barriers for the migrants. And also there are some you know, uh, emotional challenges as well. And especially forced migrant, when they left their country, they, oh, they are starting a new life and which is uh, different from the, their peers and there are other students. And uh, it's difficult for them to adapt in a new environment with all challenges, all difficulties that they have. And that's why we also, in our projects, uh, we also organize the well-being sessions for migrant students, well-being mentoring. Besides business mentoring, we also dedicated two sessions to one by one a peer, uh, and also group discussion for the uh, you know mentorship program for migrants. And I think overall, uh, I am not an academics and you are <laughs> it, uh, always with the students, but as a my European migrant platform, we also have a community, uh, you know, students who graduate looking for a job and who also looking for an opportunity and we also bring uh, established let's say established migrant with the newly arrived migrant and also we uh, match them to guide newly students to find their way and share their tested knowledge and experience as a start i can briefly say that's our issues and challenges with the migrants maybe uh, for the next question i will give more examples and more details about our works mm -hmm. Thank you, Amma. And thank you for bringing in that perspective too, that is, you know, in a, in a in a slightly different way. So not necessarily specifically within the confines of universities and students, but also how mentoring is working in, in other um, in other facets. So thank you for that. Um, so Sophia, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. I think I agree to many parts of Ahmed and Tina. So we'll just give you a bit of my options personally. I struggle quite a lot with the, the, the word mentor as a, as a whole, because for me, uh, it might have worked very well for Odysseus in the Odyssey with mentor, but I'm not quite sure if it works for, for all the cases. I think that uh, practically uh, we need to have a bit of a more peer approach because, uh, for example, when a foreigner comes to a country that exactly the cultural language is completely unknown uh, to them, is extremely important that you you take them by the hand and kind of show them the whole new fantastic world uh, and the good and the bad sides. So I think that I, I particularly agree with Tina with what she said, I am the learner here. So I think really uh, in, in peer to peer, in, in mentoring environments, both sides are, are the learners, um, especially in, uh, in countries uh, such as Greece, uh, the most challenging thing I would say for a newcomer uh, and particularly in the universities is the bureaucracy. Uh, sometimes it takes months and uh, particularly from the example of our Erasmus students, they come here for four and a half months. The two of them, they have to deal with bureaucratic issues, uh, even to be able to attend classes. Um, so I would say that uh, by removing these barriers, you, you, you make the experience more viable uh, in this sense uh, for, all, for all of them. 
um, and maybe a comment on on the social aspects. Uh, sometimes what we see again, maybe for just to give you a background very shortly, for the case of the Greek universities, we have two types of uh, of migrants, if one can say so. One is the Erasmus students visiting uh, the the institution for six months and the other are migrants that are long established in the country so they have basically went through the educational system of Greece all of uh, the primary school the junior high school the high school and they ended up in the university it's not very easy for someone else to to enter this because uh the exams and um the the overall approach to entering Greek universities already is a barrier per se for for the incomer here um, so, uh, what we have found very struggling is to actually incorporate, uh, make the classes to be one, because most of the classes are taught in, in, in Greek and not English, and this already sets a barrier. Uh, so, kind of, when the students come, they are separated to Erasmus students living the experience of a whole different uh, choice of classes, and normal students feeling a different experience. So there is no such mixing. I will keep the efforts that have been made over the past year for next questions. But I I would say if we can sum it up, uh, for the Greek case at least, it's definitely the language and the fact that most of the documents for the newcomers are in Greek, which is an issue. Uh, the cultural language and again, the bureaucracy, which is for me the biggest barrier in our case. Thank, Thank you, you, Sophia. And it's already, you know, so interesting to see um, the different aspects and the different issues that are already coming across, you know, throughout the in the in the different countries. And I know, um, for instance, in my in my own work, in my own mentoring at Maastricht University, for example, we're already doing most of our education in English and the students are getting all of their information, at least from the university in English. So we don't have these specific, you know, language barriers or things, but it's so interesting to understand um, the, the different country contexts. And I think an important thing to also bring out is diversity more generally, right? So right now we're going to have diversity between our experiences, but um, in my own experience, so I work with bachelor students, I work with master students, I work with PhD students, and I also work with students um, that are executive education students. So coming in my personal type of work, so often coming from governments and international organizations all over the world. And, I, and I've seen, you know, huge differences between what these different students need um, being foreigners in the country. And, you know, everything from, um, you know, students that want to have discussions about what their educational future looks like and what specializations they should be taking and these kinds of things to, um, you know, really being very concerned about their job prospects and their futures and, um, and also how them as an immigrant is going to relate to that. So many of them are looking at, um, are they going to be able to work, for example, in the Netherlands afterwards, or as a foreigner, if they want to move to a third country or another place, what type of immigration restrictions do they need to be looking at? What are their possible avenues? Um, so, you know, there are already a lot of things that are directly tied to their immigration status that they are concerned about. Um, and then they, you know, so you almost have to be an immigration lawyer to also give them a feedback on on what makes sense for them to even do in the future. But then they also are just interested in their job prospects and how you can help them with that and, um, you know, what their working opportunities are maybe in the Netherlands where I am right now, but also in other countries. And then you already come to things that are like differences in CV culture across different countries. And when you want to give them feedback on how their CV should be, it really depends on what countries they want to apply for jobs in, in, in the future. So already these, you know, really kind of basic things that, that are coming up. But also if you talk about the, the country itself, it's completely different. For example, if you have international students that are coming from other European countries or students that are coming from very developing countries. So I have had situations already with students, for example, from a country like Afghanistan in the past that really is is very far from the developmental level of the country like the Netherlands and and uh, um, really not even being clear or understanding how you should cross a street in the Netherlands, you know, because traffic lights are not a thing um, in in Afghanistan, you know, or knowing where you, when you can walk 
um, as a pedestrian, you know, so, so things that we would maybe never even think of as really being super challenging for foreign students can be. And there's so much diversity in what these challenges are, depending also where, where the students are coming from. So, okay, that's my two cents for, for this question. Uh, I, I know that there's a wealth of experience also in, uh, in the group right now. And I would love to hear from other people who are working with migrants, or maybe you have even been an immigrant student at some point yourself or a foreign student and can even bring in some of those experiences about your own challenges or what would have been useful for you also from a mentor. So I open the floor now to anyone if you would like to add here. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hi. Well, good afternoon there. <laughs> Um, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Romina. I did the master's, the MPP, uh, in 2018, 2019, and currently I'm mentor for inter for the students of the MPP. And something that I would like to highlight is that, well, I have been mentor for two years. This is my third one. Uh, uh, is that sometimes the uh, we are, I mean the mentees feel in the safe place with you and they share with you a very intimate information. They share their dreams, what they are passionate about, what, what they want to do um, further after finishing their studies. And what I have noticed is that sometimes they just need someone, they, they just need to be heard, to, to, be, to, to be listened, I'm sorry to be listened by someone and to feel that everything is going to be fine. Yeah, thank you. I think that's quite a good, that's a, a very good point. Sorry, I, <laughs> I'm also an, an MPP, former MPP student, and now I'm actually mentoring somebody. Too. And I think that the what motivated me to share my experience with other person is that after I finish the MPP, I know that, for example, Melissa, you do this because uh, my, my colleagues tell me nobody prepared me to do an interview for a job. Mm -hmm. And I know that you do that in your specialization. <clears throat> and it's something that is, is good that every MPP student can have. And the way in which you interview in Europe is so different from mm -hmm. the, the way you do it in, in Argentina and I remember after I finished MPP, I got one opportunity in a place that I really wanted to work. <clears throat> and I and I was all geared up for the experience and everything. And I think it slipped out of my hands because I wasn't prepared to answer in the way that it was expected. Mm -hmm. So I think that is also a very important uh, point in the mentoring. Like, how do you face the next stage after your studies? Because it's a tough one. And especially not being EU, the barriers of entry to the job market are gigantic. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's also a good thing to start to, to talk about in my experience with students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And that I think that comes out so clearly in at least so many of my mentoring meetings. I should also say, because um, we have a, quite a lot of representation here from Maastricht University and United Nations University Merit. So the shorthand that people are using when they say they did MPP is the Masters of Public Policy and Human Development that is offered at Maastricht University and the United Nations University. And we do have a whole mentoring program um, within that program. All right. Why Maybe don't I don't. Yeah, go oh. ahead, Toby. Sorry, just to add on what uh, Leopoldo just uh, said. So first of all, I'm a PhD student and I'm actually tutoring at the, this MPP that Melissa also just explained what it stands for. But um, going back to when I did my very first semester abroad, which was in the US, um, one thing was also that I encountered uh, the issue of like writing applications and interviews, which was the first time I, for me I did that in uh, a different country, different language, et cetera, but even almost more basic was how to write proper emails and what to pay attention to because it was not only studying, was also interning and then, you know, was in somewhat a more formal context and then even knowing uh, what to what to write, like how to address people if you write like kind regards, uh, best regards, like all these things um, in, I don't know, eight, nine years of English at school. This was something that 
I was just not aware, you know, what is the most appropriate thing. Also, for sure, it's different in different English speaking countries again. But just to say, like, even more basic, even though I would say I could speak English quite decently at the time already, I didn't have an issue with like not understanding the language, but just knowing what is appropriate in terms of formal communication, formal written communication, there was actually a challenge that I also didn't anticipate in advance. And I think that's something that we can also all pick up on, right? So we're also all receiving emails from students and we probably all notice that students also often write emails in a very different way. And and it's I think it's also part of our job when we're doing that, that if a student writes us an email that let's say in our context would seem inappropriate or too informal or maybe even too formal, that we in a very you know kind way address this with the student and explain what is the usual thing done in that specific context. I think that's a very important point. I mean, I I've, I know that in some contexts I have dealt with students who write emails in all capital letters, right? And in, in, and in a Western context, that is the equivalent to shouting at someone, right? So just explaining that, you know, just don't use all capital letters. <laughs> so that, yeah, there are some of these things that are actually very good points. Um, all right, I think this is a good moment to already move on to the next question. I think there are a lot of things that are coming out here. So I think the next thing that we would like to cover is really looking at the relationship between the the, the teacher or the professor um, or the mentor and the student or the mentee um, and how also cultural differences can play a role here. Um, and since I started with Tina last time, let me start with Sophia this time to maybe give your um, your impressions first. Well, uh, having not ever been a teacher or a professor, I can only speak from the experience of the person to be mentored. Um, so I think for me, and I, I guess even for for people that are in, in new situations, the most important um, aspect was to climb the, the ladder, meaning that um, sometimes there is a huge gap between what you think to be is a professor or a teacher and uh, where you are standing. So I think uh, what sometimes I, I missed in my experience so far and what I think is one of the most important uh, aspects is to, to have this approachability, to be able to be uh, approached by students, ask questions, be open, even sometimes share the expertise because uh, students have the same anxieties as uh, professors and teachers had uh, when they were the age of the of the people they are mentoring. So I think um, for me, a good mentor is someone that does not really forget this and uh, is is open to experience and uh, guide along the the emotions of the of the person and um sometimes even because professors and teachers have already evolved the way of thinking so much and have experience in something uh what uh, i don't remember the person but even the example of females that we discussed before is something that we we take as given when you have experience but when you don't, I really imagine myself and I remember myself typing the simplest email to my professors just to ask when the deadline is, uh, Google searching and trying to find out how do I need to address the professor. And uh, I think this anxiety uh, can be very easily relieved when, when the mentor is much more human that you actually depict them to be when you are a mentee. So that's my only two two dimes. Thank you. Um, and it's really great to have the 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 perspective from someone who is being mentored, right? And not just from those of us who are doing a lot of the mentoring. So thank you for that. Um, Ahmed, go ahead. I'll turn it over to you next. Thank you. I would like to stress that our organization is totally set up by migrants. So we are we think in migrant shoes. Because each day we meet new migrants, new Laura migrants, and also we understand their situation. Uh, based on my experience, I can say that uh, you know there are some cultural differences that mentors, teachers maybe take uh, that they face with the migrant students. So I think one of them is the cultural style. Um, you know, in some cultures they emphasize direct communication, 
and while others favor indirect or non-verbal uh, communication. So I know in my experience, uh, when I was a student, a PhD student, so uh, in my email, I always feel that I I shouldn't ask direct question to my you know supervisor. Instead of I should say how hello, how are you, how is it going, so, and then ask my question. But later on, I realized that. Uh, people, you know, when they communicate each other, they directly ask questions. So, and also um, in our culture, uh, for example, we if we have a question in our mind, we directly ask someone around us. But here I see people, they make an appointment, even five minutes or 10 minutes to discuss some topic. So I also realized that somehow, you know, jumping to the room and asking questions and people, they are not, you know, happy with that. So I see that you know there are lots of similarities, but also lots of differences between the cultures, and also in terms of hierarchy. So uh, even you know in some cultures, students may be less likely to question or challenge teachers because because of the respect. In if you go to the Eastern culture, you know people more respect to the teachers and they are not questioning. And even I see in our uh, group and people you know at the, at first when they met a new professor. Or new lecture, they they don't uh, call them with their name. But in 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 you know in Western culture, you know each people they call with their name, even professor or any title. But it's also take times to change uh, mindset. You can call someone with their name, not professor uh, Melissa or you know professor Tina. So it's also uh, depends on the culture and also expectation of the respect is also another difference uh, in in terms of culture. So. Uh, there are some uh, some students should be you know yeah they are relaxed and but some students they show they are respectful to the teachers so uh, th there are as i told you there are some you know uh, differences but i see uh, based on our experience um, the most important part that already mentioned um, migrant students they want to be heard and they want to be listened and especially migrant students, forced migrant students, each time they always carrying their emotional, you know, challenges with them. So I think in order to reach out to them, to help them, to touch them, first you have to listen to them and you have to understand their situation, listen to their stories, and also think they're uh, not direct, you know, uh, you know, a question or short question. Just just listen to them and feel them relax, and then you can uh, create a good communication with them. So as a migrant background, I have a lot of experience with migrants and they can reach out to me 724. Sometimes it's not good, you know, <laughs> people they reach out to in the middle of night, they have a question, yeah, I forget to apply for diploma equivalence and what should I do? So there are several questions ranging from the traffic rules, how can I car get a card, bus card? So how can I take it? So it's, you know, totally uh, lots of list of questions you can create and uh, i think in the uh, good uh, best practice i will give some examples that you know uh, we use in our with our groups that help migrants and also these uh, projects is by themselves it's also uh, helping migrant students by giving chance to the role models of the migrants as a guest lecturer and experts in their class and also to show them a role model and also to encourage them to to gain their self-confidence and self-esteem in their studies wonderful thank you ahmed now let me turn over to tina yes so as i come from finland from scandinavia we are first name basis we never call each other professor this or professor that i feel actually very uncomfortable when somebody calls me professor because we are really first name basis. And um, it's kind of very informal between us and students. We consider students as our younger colleagues. And that uh, reflects a lot how we are also treating students, that students can actually 24 seven basically contact us. And there is not this heavy barrier between us. And I noticed this when I was doing also this um, Erasmus coordinator job for quite, quite a while, 15 years almost before I went to the RDI that I had a lot of students from, uh, let's say, Korea or Japan, and they were immensely formal when they came to us and they kept distance and they bowed to us and all that. And me and my colleague, we were more like we hug, wanted to hug the students, like, welcome to Finland, you survived. It's cold, it's, you know, dark, but soon it's spring and, and sun will come. 
and first it was really confusing and, and they felt really maybe even a little uncomfortable that they, they come too close to us now. But actually the students, they really loved it. And when they left and finally after half a year or a year, then they, they brought us a lot of gifts. They hugged us. And, and I saw that it was very inspiring because they had never experienced this before. I also had uh, several times discussions, uh, for example, with my Spanish exchange students. And their experience usually is that there is a big auditorium. The professor comes in, delivers and leaves. And he or she never knows the students by name and, and they never dare to ask any questions. And it's very, very informal. You maybe send sometimes email or there is some office hour. You maybe go if you really have to go, but you never really become uh, personal with your uh, teacher. But I have very, very personal relationship with all my students and I could not do this job in any other way. I think if, if I would be there as a professor or something, I would feel very, very un uncomfortable and because I, I genuinely feel that I learned so much from students from, and especially when they come from different cultures and they give me the stories from their home and things that I would never be able to read from somewhere. So I'm very thankful to them. And I always say that for me, I'm just a member in a global village. But this is the way we do things in, in up north. So I understand that it's different in different cultures. So so that's just the, the northern way of doing things. Maybe we survive better like this, that we are close to each other in this cold and uncomfortable climate. Yes, thank you. And so I think these power distance issues are ones that are, you know, we see them pervasively. Um, in, in the Netherlands also, it's a relatively kind of low power distance country. Also, similarly, we're usually working on a first name basis. Um, and I have also often had the situations where, I mean, for example, many of us who are mentors or professors, we are extremely busy and we get hundreds of emails every day. And a student might send you an email that you miss. And then because they don't want to be rude and they don't want to bother you, they never follow up which means that they've never gotten an answer to a question or a problem. And they maybe think that you've ignored them because you don't think that they're important enough when actually you just missed their email, but they're too afraid to send a second one. You know, so you already just have these, these little things. And one of the first, because I have a tendency to sometimes miss emails, one of the first times things I tell my mentees is if you need me and I do not respond within two days, write me again, because I have just missed your mail, you know, so that they already from the beginning feel comfortable with a follow-up and don't feel like I'm going to take it as something that is, that's rude. Um, so I'm sure plenty of others have plenty of uh, experience here. So let me open up the um, the floor to to any of you who would like to also contribute here. Okay, I'm happy to do so. Yes. Um, I'm Ellen Weyenberg. I'm a professor at Ghent University in Belgium. I have a, um, a very diverse good team of uh, PhD students, primarily the good that I mentor. And my experiences align go to several things go that you guys are saying. Um, I just want to add go the element that sometimes when you know, okay, go we have to have a PhD here, so various articles and so on. I sometimes find it difficult to go to be a bit tough on people in the sense go that sometimes you have to put down the barriers and say, look. Now it's time to go to actually um, start adding up, um, doing go more things. Um, and uh, because otherwise go the PhD go won't happen. And I found go when doing that, you often have to cross go cultural barriers there because people go get uh, some kind of scared or shocked or whatever. But uh, at the same time, as a professor, I sometimes go feel obliged to go to do that. If not, go the end product will not be there, and there will be other go issues go popping up. So for me, it's a bit of a finding a balance between, on the one hand, being a mentor and indeed go having attention go for their personal story and being there in case go they want to share elements and so on. But on the other hand, making sure as some kind of manager go that go the end product will be delivered go there as well. So. To me, that's finding a balance there. That's uh, primarily my experience that I want to share today. Yes, thank you. I'm sure that many people here also feel feel similarly in that balance. And of course, as a mentor, you're often, you know, someone who's maybe there a little bit more as a friend, but often as a, for example, PhD supervisor, while you want to be friendly and understanding, it's still also your responsibility to make sure that there's a good quality PhD that comes out at the end, right? And I think, but I think often once you have 
built that um, respectful relationship with each other. You can also give tough feedback because, you know, especially when you explain that you're giving this feedback for their own benefit, right? And to try to make sure that they are going to have a good career, that their PhD is going to finish well. And I think one, I think you came across all of this very well with these these trade-offs. And I think one thing that is maybe an extra level of difficulty in mentoring or like, or having PhD students, for example, um, is that because we're all working in these like very diverse multicultural environments, sometimes we chalk a difference or a misunderstanding up to cultural differences when sometimes it's just a personality difference, right? Like we have these cultural differences, but we also just have people that are different and some people that are very open and some people that are very closed and some people that are easily offended and some people that are not offended at all. So, you know, having these kind of multi layers of things that we have to navigate are, is also quite tricky in a multicultural environment. Sorry, Sophia, you have your hand, go ahead. I was I was about to, say, to raise a very similar point with you because I think since we are in the intercultural learning online, even sometimes working among intercultural thing uh, teams is uh, is a challenge. Uh, what I've often come across um, because I I work quite a lot with young people in the volunteer context, so out of universities but still same same age, uh, is the intergenerational thing. Uh, which is a very important variable here to, to understand. Uh, oftentimes, uh, and as the, the generations that come by, uh, some of the formalities, even in the Southern states that universities professors have different, uh, different perception rather than the short name Tina mentioned. Uh, it's uh, the, the, genera the newer generations tend to be a bit more informal uh, which for some professors is always, and some mentors is always a challenge. And I think, uh, as the uh, particularly in the in the southern that we don't have, and for the case of Greece, we don't have so many professors involved. Uh, we have li limited staff uh, for each university. That means the people age while the students are always 18, 19, 20. Uh, sometimes these inter intergenerational barriers are very uh, important and difficult to overcome. So I think uh, a part of the the job of a teacher is is really sometimes to stay young, uh, and also it's one of the perks, if you ask me. Thanks, Sophia. And I just I do want to um, address before because I don't want to run out of time. One of the questions that we have in the chat, which I really appreciate that one of our colleagues here um, has a current challenge um, that she would basically like our help with. So the question is, um, I, I will just read out the question for everyone. I was recently asked to be a mentor to someone who's an aspiring master's degree candidate who has missed two appointments with me. The most current failed appointment being today. Um, and he's literally pleaded with me to mentor him. What would you advise in this situation? Um, so maybe I I'm happy to just jump in first here. So um, especially if the person really reached out to you and absolutely asked for you to mentor them, I think the first thing to do is to reach out to them and figure out why they've missed two appointments. Um, because sometimes someone can uh, ask you to, you know, to mentor them and then that might partially be because they're going through something difficult and maybe they've also missed the appointments because of an illness or um, something that's difficult going on with their family. So I think the first, what I, if I were you, the first thing I would do is to write the person back and, you know, point out that they missed the meeting and, but do it in a way that's not passive aggressive or aggressive, but just say, you know, I'm a little bit concerned. So show, you know, your concern as to um, why they've missed the meeting and you just want to check in and see if, if they're okay. Um, and then, of course, if they write you back and they are okay, you can set up another appointment. Let's say if they don't have a good reason for the fact that they have missed multiple meetings and they're just being absent-minded, then I think it's really appropriate for you to say, be very honest with them that, you know, they asked you to do this and your time is also precious. So if they are serious about mentoring, they also getting mentored, then they also need to be serious about showing up on time. So I think the reason for the fact that they have missed the meetings is really important here for how you deal with the next steps. 
that would be my opinion, but I very happy to um, open the floor here to anyone else who would like to add something or also has some advice. Sounded good, Melissa. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So then let, um, for the sake of time, and I actually think we're, we're moving along quite well here. Um, I think we can um, move on to the third question that we have, which I think we've already started to touch on also here, um, which is, you know, what are, what are some of the specific difficulties that we have faced, but also how have we overcome those things? So what are ways that we can also share with colleagues as to how to deal with some of these difficult situations um, that, that might arise? I think we've all you know, brought up a number of things that, that can happen that we have to deal with in, uh, the, in the daily work that we have. Um, so yeah, how are some ways around that? So um, Ahmed, I will begin with you this time. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I think we have a very limited time, but I would like to give some good examples that around in Belgium that also we involved in somehow. Uh, I realized that that's, you know, one of the best, I think, for the migrants, uh, for their guidance, it's the peer mentoring, you know, helping each other, you know, you know, the migrant who established his life, who has the similar situation and who know the uh, understand his situation. So uh, that's, I think, very valuable. And in Belgium, there is also another program that Duo for Job. I think it's one of the successful mentorship program uh, in Europe. So uh, there are thousands of the success stories after this program. And the idea is uh, bring young uh, students, uh, graduate students who is looking for a job and uh, with the experience over uh, plus 50, uh, you know, the mentors. And somehow you also appreciate uh, the people who is, has a lot of experience by uh, giving them chance to mentor someone. So this is a very successful program that, you know, uh, bringing these two people together. And also uh, it starts with the first meeting of the first meeting, if they agree and if they would like to continue, there is an agreement. And they sign a contract or and weekly they have a meeting two hours and uh, which is uh, last six months and based on the uh, i think numbers 90 percent of the students or uh, young people who is looking for a job after this program they find a job or in turn or somehow they find their way so and that's i think uh, very important to stress that peer mentoring and one-to-one -one tailor made uh, for each student and each student has a different expectation has a different, uh, you know, background, different culture. So there should be a tailor-made and peer-to-peer -peer, and you should find the, uh, the best match for them. And also, uh, we also encourage students and, uh, you know, people who is looking for a job to also take involved in volunteer, you know, uh, you know, activities. That's, I think, very significant to also uh, meet new people and also to, you know, make networking and also to find some opportunities as well uh, and i think that's i can say about uh, you know activities and best practices that we have in our network thank you thank you for that thank you very much um tina let me move over to you quickly yes uh at laura we have very strong peer mentoring program we have a student union and students can get even up to five credits if they support and help other students, uh, international students, uh, migrant students included. So this is something that uh, it's also very helpful for us, for Erasmus coordinators, because they can really help with the practical questions, how to get around, uh, you know, in traffic and getting this and that papers filled and tickets and whatnot. So this is something that um, many, many exchange students say that this is amazing and it is so immensely helpful. And as our language is so very, very difficult, Finnish language, as you know, Probably it's one of the toughest ones. We we do know Swedish and English basically everywhere, but still it's very helpful for the students. So I think that this is something that I'm I'm very happy that we have this program and we have yearly always new students who are coming in and the ones who were there past year they are you know also tutoring or mentoring the next one. So so this is a continuous program. So it's uh, it's always going on. In terms of uh, being myself a teacher or mentor or a tutor, teacher, or whatever you want to call it. I think one uh, word that I would emphasize here is uh, transparency. 
so that I make things transparent. I say why we do things the way we do in this country, why we expect certain things from you, <clears throat> and what is the reason we might behave this way or that way. So this helps, I think, a lot of you know students when they are a little bit feeling unsure, why is this, this so very different uh, to my home country, for example. So, so uh, these two things I would say, I, as we have so few minutes, I think that's enough for me now. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Very clear. And Sofia, over to you. Uh, from our side in the Estonian University of Thessaloniki, before the COVID, actually, we had started this program from the entire university that you could do a uh, body with a foreign student. Uh, so we paired uh, students with um, other similar peers. Unfortunately, they didn't give any credit, but the program was very successful the year uh, it worked. After COVID, it uh, stopped, uh, which is very unfortunate. Uh, but I think there are discussions now to, to bring it back. In the Department of Political Scientists, Political Sciences, we have uh, a very similar approach. We don't have so many foreign students, as I said, but we do have some Erasmus students coming. And uh, although not many, uh, they, they have this body support. And uh, what we find is uh, very helpful in terms of the university uh, professors. So we, we work in two scales on this project. It's quite new, so we don't have clear results yet. We have the more academic Erasmus body that is uh, the professor that's there mainly to guide the students towards the right classes, uh, maybe help them in the overall structure of the program, what would be fit uh, for their studies, um, what potentially from the, from the selections that they have, and the peer body that is basically to go have a beer or uh, spend the break together and then also help them with the very practical tips. Where is the class? Where is the library? Where should they sign up? And that stuff. I, I have a very good feeling for this project. Again, it started again this year uh, and we'll see how the evaluation will go. But overall, so far, there was pretty excitement in September and October. So I hopefully... This will come along very well. Thank you so much. And maybe just from my side, I think one of the things that um, I would say in general within mentoring, what I have found works the best um, in a more general perspective is really following also up on what Tina said. So I think being very open and honest with your mentees and trying to be as clear and direct as possible. Um, you know, a lot of things can get lost in translation and people give information in different ways. Um, so I think having that openness, always being very honest with the students and being as clear and direct as possible and don't talk around subjects, but just directly discuss it, I think is is quite important, or at least in my experience, that has generally worked quite well. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but I think there are so many people also that are um, in this um, in this session here that have good advice and have dealt with this very much. So I would like to open up the floor to at least a few contributions before we go. And I should also say, I yeah, I already want to uh, thank you, Julia, for putting this in the chat. Um, so if people wouldn't mind um, before you go, if you could click on um, the one of the links. So if you're a participant or if you're a panelist in this talk, if you could click on the links and just give us some feedback on on your perspectives on this webinar and, uh, um, and how it was for you, it would really just take two minutes. So it'd be much appreciated if you could do that. But now I also want to open up the floor for any additional um, feedback. Um, I can make a point to that. Um, so as someone who was, I recently finished the NPP2 and something that really helped me was um, when my mentor was, I was sometimes not sure. I come from a different culture. So sometimes I was never sure what to ask, what the discussion would be. So something that I really appreciate was, that was provided to us as students of the NPP was like a booklet which guided the discussion right because the one of the challenges is as is some is always that you as a student may not know if it's appropriate to ask the mentor and maybe the mentor too is like not sure what to really talk about so some discussion points this booklet was really helpful because it sort of guided the discussion and then of course we could deviate from it and talk about something else if 
once the mentor and I had a sort of a we established a bond or there was an understanding. So that was something that I found to be really helpful. Having something to sort of guide that um, equation. Mm-hmm. If, yeah. Thank you, Arsh, for that for that feedback. I think that's quite helpful. This may be more of a loose thought than really an advice on challenges, but when I was tutoring in the public economics year, <clears throat> I think on first sight everyone would think, okay, this is like the most extreme as like you can, as I can probably get at a university, and like 13, 14 people, probably 10 nationalities, or even more, etc. And then at the same time, some of the discussions, I felt like maybe there was more diversity in terms of opinions, polit- political values, etc. When I was in my like high school class or something, and with all the people coming from my little town, all the same age, we were brought up together, etc. But I think that just shows us that there's those different levels or layers or dimensions of diversity. One thing, the cultural background, where you were brought up, etc. But then, of course, there's a lot of self-selection also into where people go right like here un institution master's program in europe etc so i sometimes had the thought yeah well on in some way this is really as diverse as it can get but in other ways maybe it's also much more homogenous than i would have imagined actually before tutoring i think that's a good point too especially i mean there are discussions about that quite a bit you know in like international institutions for example where you have people from tons of different nationalities but they've been mainly all educated in certain institutions so then there's sometimes much less diversity than than you would think in certain ways of thinking all right i think we should wrap up there but um i really appreciate everyone's engagement and of course to the panelists thank you so much um for being willing to also take the first stab at each of these questions and um thank you for everyone else for being so engaged and also many of you were very engaged in the chat i should also thank um bo also for sending a number of uh, um key resources also in the chat that can be useful for for other people so thanks so much for for being here. Um, We'll also try to make the recording available if you have colleagues um, who you think this would also be useful for. And don't forget to um, click on those links and fill out the, um, the surveys for us. Otherwise, have a good rest of the day and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye.